Hello, my name is Karen Odramrink and I am the lead physics teacher at Ridley College in St. Catharines, Ontario. We are a private co-ed K-12 boarding school with a very international student body. We have been PASCO users for a very long time from back in the 1990s with Science Workshop and then Data Studio and now with Capstone. And about 10 years ago we started doing an IB curriculum which is an international curriculum with external exams. I teach the IB physics course, which content-wise is a very typical two-year high school physics program, but it has much more independent learning built in with an international emphasis and issues-based discussions. And the, in the second year, having to do a completely independent, self-designed, one-on-one -on -one lab work that the students make all of their own choices for. And that's where the PASCO interface systems really come into the most significant use. So throughout our first year, our lab work is not only designed to emphasize certain content points within the physics course, but also each time we're doing practical work, I'm thinking about what lab skills am I emphasizing with this particular activity. So it's from the design choices, what systems am I using, what variables, how am I controlling variables, what in instruments am I going to use to do measurements, what range of measurements do I need to take, and then on to the data analysis steps as well. How am I going to graph this data? How am I going to model this data? What mathematical functions would be most appropriate to fit this data? And what does it all mean? What are the conclusions out of my activities? In the second year then, in the fall, the students make their choices about their IAs, their independent investigations, which become 20% of their course. And this year I had 16 students. They studied a wide range of different topics from mechanics to waves to thermal to electromagnetism. Some of those students are going to give you little introductions here to what they did, give you little demonstrations, and how the PASCO systems helped them to complete their investigations. I would say about half of my students used sensor technology in some way in their investigation. Uh, and some of those have agreed to give you little demonstrations here. The students who are going to speak to you now are a range of different levels. They have different uh, proficiencies with public speaking and different levels of success in their experiments within the physics course. Uh, but hear what they have to say and you can get a sense of what the technology allowed them to do. Um, my research question is, how would the impulse change when the ball is releasing at a different angle? So the reason why I use a force sensor is, like I found it is the most difficult to find the um, force that measure like during a period because the calculate, uh, like the collision is not instant. So um, I use force sensor and so in this project, I just uh, like lined the force sensor while it was like colliding straightly to the force sensor. So what I do is I connect it to a, a Pascal universal interface and I connect it to my laptop. And uh, then it, the force sensor allows me to, uh, like it shows me the variety of forces, like the change of the forces uh, during a time period. And I, and in the capstone software, I get a trend that can, like the x, the x axis is the time and the y axis is the force. So I get, uh, like it shows me how the force changes and therefore I calculate the area under the trend and I got the uh, impulse of the ball. So like during a time period. After the experiment, I found out that <coughs> the ball is like with more angle, the more angle change, the impulse of the ball is greater, and uh, so it is the trend in the capstone, it will have a high peak. Um, yeah, and it is very useful. So my research question was, um, how does the launch speed of a basketball affect its projectile range? And the reason why I chose to study the projectile range of basketball is because my sister and I, uh, we used to play it. And uh, I was interested in knowing the physics behind how a basketball travels as we pass it or we shoot it. So um, 
The sensor I used was a photogate and basically would accurately measure the, the initial speed of the, of the projectile um, that's going to travel through it. So um, for the photogate, um, when, the ball, when the projectile goes through the gate, I have to, it has to know what the diameter of the ball is going to be. So um, in PASCO, I set it as 0 0.02. 24 meters because this measures um, 24 centimeters and then uh, basically um, I wanted to calculate the the time and the speed so I also set up the angle as 30 degrees and I'm going to So the photogate is right in front of where the ball is going to get off the launcher and then I just have to launch it um, like that. <laughs> and um, during my project I had to measure the launching height and also the landing height so it would be easier to see what, what, um, how like, gravity is going to affect the, um, the range. Um, so for, to measure where it's going to land I use carbon paper. And I use like I put the black side on the white pa paper, so it leaves like a black spot, and I have to measure it with um, a meter stick. For my conclusion, I so when I was observing, my I didn't use like a white a, a wide range of sets, uh, but I did observe that as the initial speed increased, the range increased as well. But for my on my graph, when I was recording the data. Um, it wasn't a linear graph. It was curving. It was it was curved. So this suggests maybe that um, the more the initial speed would increase, maybe it would reach a point where it would we wouldn't increase as much, and it would stop. So my research question is about what's the relationship between the pressure of the ball and the coefficient of restitution of the ball. So in order to do this experiment, I set up the ruler as uh, measure the height of the ball, and also using my phone to record the video. And I start the ball at the height of one meter, so the bottom of, bottom of the ball is at one meter high, and I drop it, so it bounces back to the rebound head. So I want to get the rebound head and the initial head in order to get the coefficient of restitution. Because the ball drops and bounces really fast, so I cannot capture the head by using my eye, so I choose to use the Pascal capstone to do the video analysis. And so it's pretty convenient to use the, uh, to use the capstone to do the video analysis. So basically, we just need to set the origin and x, y axis in the video and set the dimension as one meters and record the point on the ball and the data will be automatically generated by the capstone so it saves me a lot of time and my conclusion of this experiment is that the coefficient of restitution is increasing in a decreasing speed when the pressure goes up um, my research question was how does the cross-sectional area of a wood piece that enters into the water affect the drag force? I chose to study this because I personally wanted to know more about the physics behind how an ore works when rowing on the water so I could improve my rowing experiences and possibly maximize my efficiency with rowing in the future. Since this is a demonstration, there won't be any water, but in real cases, this is filled with water. I first measure the drag forces without the wood piece on, so I can find out the drag force of the equipment itself. Uh, and after that, I started to include the wood piece, so I put it on. Um, I used a force sensor with a sample rate of 500 Hz because I wanted to record a graph of the force versus time uh, in which the toy car was operated under the constant speed. And then I'll be able to get an average of all 500 data points per second recorded. 
Uh, I also used a motion sensor with a sample rate of 20 hertz, so I was able to record a graph of velocity versus time, and I will be able to select the corresponding portion of the data points to make sure that the toy car was uh, operating at the constant velocity. After those steps, I will replot the data points to a drag force versus areas graph, and it's clearly showing that uh, the linear trend with a positive slope. So I found out that the size of the drag force in the fluid depends on the areas of the wooden piece that enters into the water. As the areas of wood piece that enters into water increases, the drag force also increases. So um, the research question for the experiment that I've decided to conduct uh, was uh, how is the magnetic field strength of a solenoid uh, affected by the current flowing through it? So the way I have this set up is I have a power source here which, uh, with which you can, when turned on, uh, the voltage and the uh, current uh, of an electric charge is uh, measured. So I have these set up. I have a 30 ohm resistor. Uh, so like that, it's reducing the amount of, uh, of charge going through the wires like that. Nothing uh, gets overheated or anything. Uh, so I have this set up with a solenoid, which is wrapped, uh, which is copper wire wrapped around a uh, cardboard base, 2,190 times. Uh, so when the electric charge passes through that solenoid, an electromagnetic magnetic field is created. Uh, so I'm using a PASCO wireless uh, magnetic field sensor. I have got it connected to an interface here. I'm using the axial, um, the axial sensor uh, as I can get it a lot closer to the uh, magnetic field than I can the perpendicular sensor. Uh, so when uh, the voltage and the current is turned up, uh, a uh, magnetic field will be created, and so the sensor will be reading that magnetic field, relaying it to the interface, and with the interface connected to the laptop, I'll be projecting a, a graph of uh, magnetic field over time, uh, although it is a, a con uh, constant value. Uh, what else do I need to? Um, so essentially what I found out was that as you increase current, magnetic field strength uh, increases. Uh, I did three, tri um, yeah, three trials of each, uh, of each current, so a total of 15 trials were conducted. Uh, for every five sets of trials, I changed the voltage for each uh, current uh, value. So I used the maximum, the minimum, and the median amount of voltage required. And so those all gave me different values. Uh, as you can guess, the higher voltage, the higher the magnetic field strength, lower voltage, the lower magnetic field strength. Uh, and so essentially the research question was answered with the higher the current, the stronger the magnetic field. Uh, my research question is why is it that a higher water level in the beaker makes the higher the pitch of the beaker sound? So this is a lab about the sound resonance frequency. Uh, I choose to study this because like personally I'm a music person and have the interest in the wine glass music which I use the science beaker to replace the wine glass. And uh, initially I thought if I got the equation between like the water levels and then like what the frequency of the sound will become. Like I can simply calculate and like, uh, and I don't need a uh, pitch uh, collector to know is that um, the sound in a perfect pitch or not. Uh, for how I collect the data, uh, I use the uh, PASO interface and then the sound sensor. Uh, I connect uh, this machine with the sound sensor, I used another side to collect to my laptop, and therefore, uh, when I was want uh, when I want to collect the uh, sound frequency, I can just put my sound sensor close to the beaker, and I use the uh, this glass stick to knock the beaker. Like for example, here the beaker is in 100 uh, milliliters. Like I can just knock the sound, and the laptops will collect the sample. Originally, I, sound, like, I thought if the water level becomes higher and the sound frequency uh, will become lower because the, the space of the water, like the volume of water is increasing. Therefore, like, uh, the oscillations are, the frequency of oscillations are getting slower. Therefore, the sound frequency should be uh, lower as well. But however, uh, I think I got it wrong. The, like, the sound, um, sorry, 
the material that are making sound is not water when an octane beaker is actually the air, like vibrations, the air vibrations. Therefore, like when the water vo volume increases, um, there are less space for air to vibrate. So therefore, I found the result is totally opposite as my research question. Therefore, like I used a lot of time to change it. Okay, so I want to thank the students who agreed to do that. Uh, it was not easy for them. They were a little bit stressed about having to speak in front of the camera. But I think they did a great job. Uh, I hope you got a sense of the learning that was involved in this process, both in the independent lab work in general. Uh, many of them had to do you know, multiple trials and errors, and it was not as smooth as it looked like it was in their little couple minute introduction. Uh, and in some cases, they started with a very different measurement method than what they ended with. Some of them uh, tried manual measurement and ended up with sensor technology. Some of them started with sensor technology and ended up with manual measurement. Some of them had to completely change their methods in general because what they had thought was going to work in the first place just didn't. But overall, I think it's a great sense of accomplishment when they finish. And you can imagine, if you're in a classroom at all, when I had 16 students in here all doing different things, from the coefficient of restitution of balls as functions of pressure or temperature, to thermal expansion, to uh, you saw one of the girls doing the effect of cross-sectional area on the drag force through a big tub of water. Uh, another student was looking at the different spectrums of light that is emitted from a light bulb at different temperatures. So 16 students all doing different things, all asking different questions. It was chaos and it was all students engaged and learning and a lot of fun. So I hope you got something from this, whether you're a beginner that is getting some confidence to go out and try some things or a veteran who is maybe getting some new ideas or some th thoughts about new questions. Either way, enjoy and good luck. <laughs>